morning, everyone. I'm Anita Finley, your Zero Times TV presenter, and I'm so happy to be here with you this morning. So hello, everybody. I'm saying hello because we're doing this from our homes. We don't go to offices. However, physicians can't do their work from home, unfortunately, and especially someone like our guest this morning, uh, Dr. Lloyd Zucker. He really morning. can't do this. Hi, good morning, Dr. Zucker. You know, I guess you're laughing when a lot of people are, you know, the lawyers and, and all sorts of people are at home or other places are not in their offices, but, but you could never be home. You have to be in a very high powered location. Why don't you just tell everybody, of course, we call you a neurologist, but you're so much more nope. a, a neurosurgeon and you do, you do things I didn't know that neurosurgeons did. So why don't you kind of give us an elevator speech? Okay, well, um, as you probably know, I'm Chief of Neurosurgery at Delray, yep. Director of Neurosurgical Services at the Delray Medical Center and at Good Samaritan. Um, and neurosurgeons operate on the brain and spine. So um, in terms of the brain, brain tumors, hemorrhages, um, other abnormalities, certainly um, something that I think as uh, our population uh, ages, something called normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is an issue with balance and walking. I also do surgery for movement disorders, so essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. And oh, wow. if, that wasn't, if that wasn't enough, then we go to the spine. Um, and, you know, the spine comes with everything. So there's degenerative arthritic changes, there's pressures on nerves, there's sciatica in the legs, and obviously kind of a version of that in the arms. So any of the surgeries for spinal stenosis or disc herniations are things that we do. And uh, Delray is a level one trauma center. So any trauma that involves the brain or the spine in the brain, it's usually hemorrhages or fractures in the spine. Uh, it can be a host of different things. So um, we stay busy. Yes, you do. And I actually, I, I did get down to Boca Raton Regional. Are you still doing working at the Marcus Brain Surgeon uh, there? Well, the Marcus Neuroscience Center. Yes, I am on staff Fabulous. there as well. Yeah. Um, and um, we're very fortunate, uh, you know, between... Um, are, I'll call them community hospitals, which is, I think, a misstatement because we're blessed with staff and technologies that I, I think many academic programs would be envious of. Yes. Actually, I read so much about you and, and what you do and about the whole field. And um, let's see, we've just lost you. You're Hold on the phone? Oh, there you yeah, are. Now, let me get rid of this. Okay, because we um, want to see your good-looking face. <laughs> there you are again. Okay. okay. You're, you're fine. So I read a lot about it, and I happen to be a gerontologist, and I, of course, deal with a lot of elder people who do have the need for someone like you. But after reading about you, if anything happens, I'm going to put your name in my wallet and said, find him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Well, let's just start when you were a kid and you were decided you wanted to be a doctor. Did you always decide to be a doctor? Or was that your family's idea? No, actually, my family didn't push me at all. Um, I was, uh, I guess, blessed um, with, you know, the, the science and math background. So I kind of always tracked into that. Um, my dad had polio when he was a youngster. So <laughs> Kind of early on, I think I had an inkling that medicine was in my going to be in my blood. I did volunteer work when I was, you know, in junior high and high school. And then it just seemed kind of a, a natural. I ended up going to Johns Hopkins. Okay. And, you know, if you're going to get bread to do medicine, not a bad place to end up. Um, and uh got involved in research while I was there, spent some time at the hospitals when I was there, actually did some research down at the National Institutes of Health mm -hmm. and um, kind of proved to me that although research was fun, I liked spending time with patients 
I turned down a job offer when I was at NIH from a little small upstart company called Genentech. <laughs> Boy, I, I, don't, I, I, I will still look back and say I don't regret the decision, but I think I should have bought stock back then. Yeah, true. Well, <laughs> so, so I see. But then what made you specialize in the uh, neurosurgery? Well, um, I actually, you know, kind of extending from my dad, I was actually going to be an orthopedist for years. And um, I did some rotations in orthopedics and not taking anything away from my orthopedic colleagues. It didn't have the, the zing that I wanted it to. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, my advisor in medical school was a retired neurosurgeon. Ah. And I was, uh, I was putty. So when I came back <laughs> to him after doing some orthopedic rotations and said, Bob, what, what am I going to do? I don't want to be an orthopedic surgeon. Right. I've never seen, never seen a man smile so quickly. Uh, he said, uh, here's a phone number. I want you to go see a friend of mine. And I went and spent a few days with a neurosurgeon. And um, that was it. I was uh, yeah. hook, hook, line, and sinker. And you've been doing this for a long time. You don't look that old, but I guess you, uh, you, you must, you know, when you're a passionate person about what you do, you stay young. And that's what's happened with you. It certainly takes something that I think in many people's minds and eyes, if they knew the hours that I worked, would say, oh, my God, what an effort. And, yeah, I mean, I get tired like every other human being. But you're 100 sure. percent right. If you're passionate about what you do and you enjoy what you do, getting up every day to do it is not a burden. It's an honor. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I know you from the bio, the way that it was put together, someone really knew you because it's, it's not so statistical as compassionate and it's really lovely. And so Thank had you. you ever considered writing a book? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Up? I don't know if there's a physician that hasn't considered that. Um, uh, I, uh, I wrote some when I was in college. Uh, I jokingly have said that if I write a book, the first chapter is going to be one line, and it's going to be, if I thought about my job the way everybody thinks about my job, I couldn't do my job. Um, um, you know, it's, I, I'll thank you because I think that if anything sets me apart, and I've found this over the years, it's the ability to communicate. I mean, you have to be able to deliver what you do, regardless of your walk of life, in an understandable fashion. And if people feel that and they sense the passion um, and you have an ability to communicate, there's nothing you can't do. Oh, that's well spoken. I want everyone to know if you've just tuned in, I'm talking with Dr. Lloyd, excuse me, Dr. Lloyd Sucker. And he's being, we're sponsored by Delray Medical Center a great hospital, of course, in Delray Beach. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Zucker because he's a neuro, well, it, people say neurologist. No, he's not a neurologist. No. He's a neurosurgeon and he does so many things. And I want to go back to your father for a minute. When he had polio, he wasn't an iron lung though. He just walked with a, a limp. Or well, a dad, dad had it back in 1930. So it was the first big, you know, polio epidemic. And he spent some short period of time with respiratory issues. But, you know, I basically lived with a man that had, uh, you know, atrophic muscles in one leg and had a limp and played sports and was a successful businessman wow. and basically gave me, you know, the, the moxie yeah. to say, yeah. look, he used right. to say to me, if you don't ask, the answer is no. So if that puts the man in perspective, you know, you can, you, you try. And, you know, you, if you fail, which a lot of us do more than we succeed, you brush it off, you learn from it, and you move forward. It's just, I asked you that because in, I lived in Minneapolis for a while and I actually volunteered for a woman who had been in an iron lung for many years. She could move her head, nothing else, but she's painted with a stick in her mouth. She did a lot of things. So polio, people have no idea really what that was like. And then with the 
this terrible COVID, uh, people complain about wearing masks and here you have to wear a mask every day when you work. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. No, I mean, I mean, as as colleagues, I think that you know, this was a scary disease because you know I've lived through the AIDS epidemic and some other things, but this was the first time that I think we all really worried about bringing it home to our families. Yeah. And you know, yeah, it, it may people may not have believed it, but you know, I'd come home, I'd strip down in the garage. I'd spray the mask with Lysol. I'd go straight up to the shower. You know, it was really a very different disease. And there's 500,000 reasons why I think we had to treat it the way that we did. Yeah. Well, what I'd like to do is um, I do want to ask you a few things about, I actually be thinking, because I'm going to ask you one other thing, be thinking about a very special case that you performed your skill on and what happened so people do understand sure. but have you been dealing with ALS at all is that in your field it's really more in the wheelhouse of my neurology colleagues mm -hmm. um, I would love for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis to get to the point where there is a surgical role um, but right now kind of I think you know, it's, I shouldn't say the present day polio because it's obviously a different disease, but it's still one of those neurologic diseases that hasn't become amenable to some kind of surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. And I think as we understand, I was a genetics major at Hopkins. There are some diseases that I think are going to be worked on, if not solved at a more granular genetic level and not necessarily by surgery per se. Yeah, well, that's, I was curious when I was talking to you. So let's talk about, so people are saying, okay, what does Dr. Zucker really do? Well, we know you said, you know, you help people who have strokes with hemogenic, lots of things that people can understand, but I'm sure there are cases that you walked into and said, oh boy, I'm really going to have to use my skills on this one. And and it did turn out well. Can you put your finger, I know you've had so many of these, but what's a particular one? You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, although as you've said, there, there are certainly lots of different cases and lots of different areas of neurosurgery. Uh, I think one of my favorite surgeries to do is my deep brain stimulation because you take patients that, uh, I'll give you an example, somebody with a central tremor um, who spends their life trying to explain to people they don't have Parkinson's. They shake, but they, they, it's not Parkinson's disease, but they can't drink from a cup. They can't use a spoon. They can't cut steak. And these people slowly but surely become shut-ins um, because the disease is so um, pervasive into their day-to-day -day existence. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm fortunate to work with a very good movement disorder neurologist, Dr. Dalvey, and he comes to the OR with me and we were working on one of our patients and it's quite dramatic because when we find our target, the hand goes from shaking and stops, um, which is kind of that magic trick rabbit out of the hat for everybody else that's in the room, you know, and I consider myself, you know, the old jaded guy that's done hundreds of these and it still gets to me a little bit. And Dr. Dalvey looked at the patient and says, what do you think? And the guy looks up and he says, when's the last time you saw your hand like that? And the gentleman who's in a frame, so he can't move his head, moves his eyes to the side, looks at us and said, never and burst into tears. Oh. And every, I mean, there was literally not a dry eye in the room. Oh. So, you know, I, I think it's taking something like that, which is a benign disease. I mean, we operate on cancers and it's all very necessary and we love trying to help. But to take a, a benign disease that's totally disrupted somebody's life and literally giving them back their life, not to sound melodramatic, but these people come in post-op and, you know, the best one, when you say, tell me about a case, we had a gal that um, 
literally couldn't sign her name. And we did the procedure and she was actually from out of state. And the next day she flew home. And I don't know if you've seen those adult coloring books. They have like Hindu yes. designs and stuff. Yes. She wrote a card. She said, just so you understand, this is being written with the hand that I couldn't use and sent us a picture that she had colored with that hand that a day earlier she couldn't use. <laughs> And um, if I don't, my wife has this box where she saves cards and pictures like that from yeah. patients. Yeah. Rest assured that went into the box. Yes, of course. Well, I want to ask you a question. I've always been curious when you can operate on people and they're not sleeping because right. you have to be able to know what right. is that person feeling? There's no pain. What are they? Do you tell we us do how that, that works? Well, we do that for a number of different reasons. The surgery I just described to you, the Parkinson's and essential tremor, we do so we can monitor the target. When we have tumors that are either near motor cortex or near visual cortex or near speech, the, the most um, discreet monitor of function is having the function there in front of you. So we anesthetize the skin, we sedate the patient, we open the skull, we open the dura, and then once the brain is exposed, we wake the patient up. The brain has no pain receptors. So by touching the surface of the brain with an electrode while the patient is performing a task, we can interrupt or disrupt that task, and that's telling us that that area of the brain is very vital in that function. And so that's how in some of these, um, I won't say eloquent areas because all the brain is eloquent, but in some of these more eloquent areas where disruption would certainly affect, you know, day-to-day -day functioning, um, that's how we monitor that. And uh, yeah, it sounds, kind of bizarre or cruel, but the brain has no pain receptors. It's almost as if mother nature knew in order to cram everything in there that she needed, she didn't need to yeah. do that. So yeah, we do fairly regularly. I, I don't know if I can say every month, but certainly on our majority of our tumors that are in areas that we have questions, um, it's part of our uh, armamentarium. We use some interesting dyes that fluoresce um, under certain kinds of light and they set apart the tumor from the surrounding brain. We have some very specialized technologies to get deep within the brain without injuring the brain overlying it. So uh, as I said, we're, we're certainly blessed with a lot of technology and we have a wonderful supportive staff of nurses and can't do it without a supportive administration either. So uh, we've been lucky. Well, they're lucky to have you. And I know that you're Dr. Lloyd Zucker and he's, he's certainly, he talks from his heart. He talks from experience. It's sponsored by the Delray Medical Center. They're an incredible um, hospital and medical center in Delray Beach. But um, as you were talking, I was thinking I had been working with Scripps Research on doing some things and, and I had one of their their uh, doctors, uh, PhDs, come and talk to us, talk to a certain meeting, and he did something that we all were shocked. He brought a brain, and none uh. of us had really seen a brain <laughs> that way. And he brought this brain, and I think some people faded, not really, but that was a very interesting thing because you talk about the brain, and yet, you know, we know it's up there, it's all covered, <laughs> but we mm -hmm. don't really see it. It did. Uh, I'm glad that. The, they brought it because it really gives you an appreciation for just how remarkable, um, I hate to call it a computer because it's far more than just, just how remarkable that organ is. Um, and there's still a lot to learn about. You know, it's kind of to me like the ocean. You know, we, we know about 20% of what's going on. Yeah, well, the one other question I have is why is it when people have brain cancer, it seems like that there, there's not a very high percentage of uh, recovery. Well, um, 
there's a couple of things there. You know, I think we understand a little bit more now about what may cause some of these. Um, the ability to operate on them has improved. And, you know, as I think we're seeing in many different kinds of cancer, um, the uh, what I'll call the adjuvant therapy. So the chemotherapies and the radiations, the brain's funny. A lot of the things that are designed to protect the brain in its normal day-to-day -day function have shielded the brain from some of the therapies that may work elsewhere in the body. And uh -huh. we're actually learning both different compounds that can cross that barrier. And there's something that I do called focused ultrasound, which is being utilized now to open that barrier to try and let some chemicals in. So, you know, I think we're on the cusp of seeing um, better treatments. You know, I know that when I started in medicine, the concept of, you know, having breast cancer survivors, let alone remission was a dream. And now, you know, it's, it, it's something that we talk about all the time. Melanoma, you know, we're treating that. Renal cell, we're treating that. So there's stuff coming. Um, my wife's heard me call brain cancer the bane of my existence because it hasn't changed a lot, but I think we're starting to see it round that corner. Yeah, I, I'm sure. So you talk about your family. You have grandchildren, I have to assume? No, not yet. Not yet. Kids, oh, not kids, yet. no okay. grandkids. Um, <laughs> okay, but, um, kids um, no grandkids. They're going to get working on it, I hope. Yeah, well, they, but you have no time right now anyway. So, so um, <laughs> yeah. let, me, let, let me pursue this a little bit further, though. We just have a little bit more time. So when you... Um, how many surgeries can you typically do in a day? Uh, it depends on the kind of surgery. Um, sometimes two, sometimes three. Um, if there are emergencies and the need arises, we kind of hunker down and do what needs to be done. And I've spent 24 hours straight in the hospital operating if the need is there. But, uh, you know, that's... It's been so much a part of my life for so long, I don't even think about it as abnormal. So you just, uh, Dr. Zucker, we need you, to, you know, come to upper operation room, you know, come yep. to, we need you to do this, right? Pretty, well, pretty much so, we're, we're on call. <laughs> I'm a member of a, a group, you know, Brain and Spine Center. We have an office in Delray and an office up in West Palm. And, you know, ah. we cover all three hospitals. So basically, yeah, they call us, we come. I'd like to come and meet you sometime there. It seems like uh, be, you're, yeah. Be my you're, pleasure. You're, uh, yeah, you are you have so many good things and maybe uh, we can talk about some more of the, the great, you know, important things that the brain does. But I was, I was going to talk a little bit about Parkinson's, but you kind of I know you deal with Parkinson's, but it was interesting that you shared there are tremors that are not Parkinsonians, but, uh, but yeah, the Parkinson's, so what's happening with Parkinson's? And if we have any time, is that, are you able to help those people? Yeah, I mean, we definitely what deep brain stimulation has been shown to do, Parkinson's patients have what are called on periods, and that's where they're functioning at the best that they can. A lot of times what you see are what are called motor flux fluctuations. So the medicine doesn't work as well constantly. And what deep brain stimulation can do is make that on period more consistent. So that translates into a patient that's more productive or functional. They can predict when their on and off periods might be. So yeah, we, and we have a very busy movement disorder service at Del Rey. We've done over a hundred deep brain stimulation cases oh, and uh, continue doing them. So it's one of the things that we definitely enjoy doing. I've been so amazed with Michael Fox. I guess we now have two minutes, but what he's been doing, I have no idea what he's been doing, but he's, he's okay, isn't he in a way? He's, he's okay. Going. Some of what we see in Michael now are the side effects of medications. But, you know, as a kudo to him, Michael yeah. has done more, I think, to accelerate the search for the cure 
and then, you know, not taking anything away from the National Parkinson's Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. But I think when a celebrity uses their kind of bully pulpit right. to help, yeah. you know, there's, there's, no, there's no question he's had a positive impact. Well, you're a celebrity in my eyes. I have to tell you, I, you know, I mean, I, of course, I, of course I read your bio, but I do look forward to talking with you. You're really extraordinary. So thank you very much for taking your time and have a very successful, happy day today, Dr. Zucker. My pleasure. Thank you again. And when any of your folks out there need anything, we're glad oh, yeah. to help. Them. Oh, they'll go. I'm sure they're going to go to you. Goodbye, everybody. We'll Take be care. back with another interview. Okay, thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye.